This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today in Russia, where President Vladimir Putin has signed a decree pardoning the country's former richest man. Amnesty International had declared Mikhail Khodorkovsky a prisoner of conscience. He spent more than a decade behind bars after he fell into disfavor with Putin. Uh, the release comes as the Russian parliament voted Wednesday to approve a mass amnesty for thousands more prisoners. Up to 22,000 are set to be eventually freed under an initiative Putin says is meant to mark the 20th anniversary of the passage of Russia's post-Soviet constitution. Critics say Putin also hopes to deflect international criticism of his human rights crackdown ahead of the 2014 Sochi Winter Games. Among the tens of thousands set to be released are members of the punk group Pussy Riot, as well as the Greenpeace Arctic 30, who were arrested in September after trying to stop Russian oil drilling in the Arctic. After the vote, Arctic 30 member Frank Hewitson said the fate of the Arctic remains unchanged. We're very happy. We just hope it doesn't take too long for us to actually have our passport stamped with the correct visa and returns back to our countries. We might have been given amnesty today, but there's no amnesty for the Arctic. These companies need to be stopped. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin suggested the Greenpeace activists may have been acting at the behest of a foreign country in an attempt to undermine Russia's development of Arctic energy resources. Putin did not name the country. As for the fact that they are covered by amnesty, and as far as I know, they are covered by it, we are not doing it for them. But if they are covered, that's good. I think what's happened should be a lesson and that we should both, I hope Greenpeace as well, turn to positive work in order to make noise. But in order to minimize environmental risks, if such risks appear, we are ready for such joint work, including work with Greenpeace. To talk more about the amnesty, we go to St. Petersburg, Russia, where we're joined by two of the Arctic 30 activists. Peter Wilcox was the captain of the Arctic Sunrise and has worked with Greenpeace for decades. Dmitry Litvinov, who is a Russian-born U.S. and Swedish citizen, has worked with Greenpeace since 1989. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's start with Peter Wilcox, your response to the amnesty that you all have been granted. Well, we're glad it happened, but we're still wondering why we need to be amnesty for something we didn't do. According to the World Court, we were arrested illegally on the high seas, illegally brought into Russia, and illegally detained. So we don't feel, A, that we have anything to apologize for, or B, that we need amnesty for. And this suggestion by uh, President uh, Putin that uh, you are acting at the behest of some foreign uh, government? Uh, that just seems like such a silly and stupid claim that uh, I really don't need to respond to it. Uh, Greenpeace books are open, our fundraising. We, we don't even accept corporate or government sponsorships of any kind. So such a claim is, is just ludicrous. Um, Dmitry Litvinov, can you talk about what it is that you did, that you were first charged for, and then how long were you held for before you were granted bail and then now, of course, the amnesty decision? Well, uh, what we did and what we were charged for are two completely different things. We went out to the Russian Arctic in order to uh, shine the light on the destructive activities that are being carried out there by the uh, Russian and foreign oil companies. Uh, there is a rush for the Arctic shelf right now that has now become navigable due to climate change, uh, and oil companies are rushing in there in order to start drilling for oil. Uh, this is in an area which has uh, extreme meteorological conditions, which has very difficult uh, navigational conditions, uh, and where there's practically no infrastructure for cleanup in case of, or rather I should say, when an oil spill would occur. Um, and well, we saw, I heard earlier today, we were speaking about the Gulf of Mexico. We saw what happened in the Gulf of Mexico, where even under the most favorable conditions, we saw very, very difficult environmental results. If such a spill were to occur in the Arctic, uh, it would be absolutely catastrophic. So uh, the purpose of us sending a ship and going there uh, earlier this year was in order to bring attention to the problem and to carry out 
peaceful, nonviolent protest, as we have been doing all around the Arctic region. We protested over Greenland, over Norway, over Alaska, etc. It's not a Russian problem, it's an unfortunately a global problem. Uh, the charges that were brought against us to start with were the first one was that of piracy. Uh, we were accused of uh, an armed takeover of a ship for personal gain. Um, each one of the elements of the sentence had nothing to do with what we did. Uh, it was no takeover, there was no ship, and uh, there was certainly no personal gain involved. Uh, we have spent altogether uh, two months, uh, one of us actually it was a bit longer, um, in detention, first in a uh, prison in, uh, in jail in uh, Murmansk, in the north of Russia, and then subsequently uh, two weeks in, uh, uh, in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, we've been released uh, a little bit over three weeks ago, and since then we've been kept, well, I should say in a much bigger and more comfortable cell. We're still detained in Russia, but we're at least allowed to be staying in a hotel and uh, to talk to each other. Uh, Dimitri, I wanted to ask you, at the time you were jailed, uh, your father uh, wrote an op-ed piece in The Washington Post urging your release. And uh, the piece was titled, My Son Facing Russian Prison for a Peaceful Protest. In it, he wrote that Dima has the sad distinction of possibly becoming the third generation of political prisoners in our family. Uh, can you tell us something about the history of, of your family and, and these uh, run-ins uh, with uh, authorities because of, your, of, of its uh, political involvement? Sure. Uh, I think, uh, actually, Dad got it a bit wrong. I think, actually, it's the fourth generation, if we're going to really count. Um, my great-grandfather uh, was uh, one of the leading communists before the revolution, and so he opposed the Tsar's regime and uh, ended up being uh, prosecuted for that. Uh, he subsequently became uh, one uh, uh, of the closest collaborators of uh, Stalin and Lenin, was actually foreign minister under Stalin. Um, my grandfather uh, was accused for a political crime and spent uh, years and years in uh, prison during Stalin's time. Um, his fate was described in a number of books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, and then my father went on a protest demonstration against the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet tanks in 1968, uh, together with six other people. The seven people got fairly hard sentences. My father spent uh, five years in Siberia. The whole family went there. I went to school there. My sister was born there. Um, in fact, the first time that I was ever arrested for a Greenpeace action in Russia, my grandfather gave an interview where he was asked, what do you think about your grandson going, getting arrested in, by, the, by the KGB at that point? And, and he said, well, it's a third generation going to prison for a good thing. Mm. Uh, Peter Wilcox, can you share your history? Um, you go way back to the first uh, Greenpeace ship, the Rainbow Warrior. Talk about what happened there. Well, like Dima, I'm sort of a third-generation activist. My grandparents and mother were all before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Uh, my grandfather lost his company because of his leading a peace delegation to China in 1952. And I started with Greenpeace. I started uh, working on boats for the environment in 1973. I joined Greenpeace in 81 and, yes, was on the first Rainbow Warrior when it was blown up by the French in uh, Auckland, New Zealand in 1985. Just tell us briefly, for people who don't know that he history, uh, talk about what French intelligence did. Well, uh, the French intelligence service was ordered by Mitterrand to stop Greenpeace from going to French Polynesia and protesting the nuclear testing issues there. Uh, we had just come from the U.S. Marshall Islands where, thanks to the U.S. testing program, we had had to move a group of about 350 islanders from their purposely contaminated island to a, a slightly safer one. Uh, we went to New Zealand to prepare to go to French Polynesia, and the French decided to anticipate us. The first bomb blew a six-by-seven-foot hole in the side of the hull. The second bomb that went off uh, about 45 seconds later trapped our photographer, Fernando, Fernando Pereira, in his cabin and killed him. Uh, he was the only crew member with two children, and his murder certainly ripped a hole in their lives that really has never been repaired. 
And then talk about what happened to you. While you've been granted amnesty, you were jailed. Can, uh, starting with Peter, can you both describe your time in jail and what, where you go from here? Well, when you're held in Russia uh, under investigation for a crime, it's called isolation. And you're in one cell 23 hours a day. You supposedly have about an hour in an exercise cell, which is only slightly bigger than the cell you were first kept in. Uh, and you're really isolated uh, from all your family colleagues. It was uh, a month before I was able to speak to my wife. It was almost a month before I was able to speak to my lawyer. Um, yeah, you're in isolation. Yeah, I can add to that. Uh, I mean, I think that absolutely isolation is uh, uh, is the, the worst one of the worst elements of being held in, in the prison. I mean, the, the the physical conditions were not the main part of the problem. Um, well, sure, it was crap food and uh, you know very cold at night, and uh, you know you only got 15 minutes of shower per week. But that that you can live with. You know, we can live in fairly uh, tough field conditions. The worst thing is the psychological pressure. I think what Peter is talking about, this isolation, uh, it was one of the one of these uh, very strong uh, elements of pressure that, that made made life very hard. The, the, another one is uh, the, this uncertainty. You don't know what's coming. You don't know how long you're going to be sitting there. You don't know how it will result. I mean, on one hand, the, the rational part of your mind says, well, this is impossible. Even in Putin's Russia, they cannot lock 30 people for something they didn't do for 10 to 15 years, which is what the first sentence was that we were looking at. Um, you know, 19 of them foreigners is just not acceptable. It's not going to happen. But then you're but then you're in jail. And then yeah, you're in we, jail. We and told then, ourselves that the first day, and that night we were in jail. Exactly. And, and then you know, and you go you go to an investigation, and you see and you see these very serious men in very serious uniforms, and very <laughs> telling you absolutely seriously, we are convinced that you're the, pirates. The most the most bizarre evidence. They claim that we weren't really environmentalists. They claim that we led an armed attack on the rig. I mean, the first rule about a Greenpeace demonstration is is that it's nonviolent. The second rule is that there's absolutely no property damage to the object of the action or demonstration. And you do these things, and these are the kinds of things that prevent a reasonable prosecutor from even thinking of the word piracy. So on one hand, it seems so absurd. On the other hand, you're sitting in detention, you're sitting in jail. And there you are. And, you, and you're facing 10 to 15 years. And you don't know when it's going to end. So that, that's the second. And the, the last thing I think kind of very much along those lines uh, is just this feeling of this is so unfair. This is so unjust, you know. Uh, we didn't do anything wrong that is anywhere near the the kind of response that we're we, getting. I we mean, didn't do anything we hadn't done the year before. Exactly. So, I mean... We met a lot of people in prison, uh, cellmates, and some of them, most of them, were in there for a crime, or at least reasonably suspected for a crime. And these are nice enough fellows, and uh, you know, some of them were, you know, probably should have been treated more easily than they were, or whatever. But there was a crime committed, um, so there was a reason why they were locked up. For, for the 30 of, 30 of us, it was this feeling that they have no reason. It's so unfair. So I think those three pieces of psychological pressure, for me at least, was the hardest thing to deal with, the, the isolation, the uncertainty, and the unfairness. And, and Dmitry, I wanted to ask you about this decision of the Russian government. Uh, as many as 20,000 people uh, uh, amnesty. Do you see this as any kind of a, a major shift uh, in the increasing authoritarianism of the uh, Putin government, or is this more a public relations uh, ploy uh, uh, in the run-up to the Winter Games, the Winter I'll Olympics? I don't claim to be in any sort of political analyst, Juan, so I'm not even going to try to answer that question. I'm just very happy that uh, uh, that we get to go home soon, uh, even though there is this sour aftertaste, as, uh, as Peter said, that, um, you know, it's we shouldn't have been arrested to start with. And uh, we should not be uh, given an amnesty. We should be given an apology and a medal, in my opinion. And we're still most concerned about the fate of our four Russian colleagues Indeed. that have to continue to live here. And now they may have criminal records hanging over their heads. So that's something that worries us a lot. Absolutely. And as far as your question is concerned, well, um, as, as far as I understand, um, quite a number of those prisoners are, that are to be released are indeed what would be qualified and is qualified uh, as political prisoners. Um, but then there are also uh, just 
people who have been arrested for a, um, uh, a violent crime or, uh, or some other type of crime. And uh, um, this is an amnesty that is associated, I understand, with the 20th anniversary of Russian Constitution, uh, some sort of an unanimous act. And um, look, after those two months in prison, if, people's, if people are being released, you know, from I'm glad for them, you know, no matter what crime they have committed, for them personally, I'm glad that they don't have to be sitting in those conditions that we were sitting in. Um, when Democracy Now! was in Warsaw last month to cover the U.N. Climate Summit, I had a chance to sit down with Greenpeace Executive Director Kumi Naidu. Uh, Kumi, who was involved with last year's action, you were pointing out, Peter, they did not get arrested. Maybe they didn't get arrested because he's the executive director involved with trying to stop uh, Arctic drilling by Gazprom. Um, he talked about how energy companies should respond to global global warming concerns? We, we would say to all energy company leaders, right, from Gazprom to Shell to ExxonMobil and all the rest, as Greenpeace, when we look at you, we see you as an energy company. As an energy company, we cannot blame you 20 years ago or, say, even 15 years ago for building energy based on oil, coal and gas. However, now you need to understand that the scientific consensus is completely clear, and even if the science was not clear, the last decade has seen more than a 10 percent increase in extreme weather events, the very events that the scientists say that that's how climate change will be looking at. So now you do not have an excuse. The facts are before you, and you need to understand that every cent that you invest in new projects is an investment in the debt of our children and their children and future generations. That's Kumi Naidu, Greenpeace executive director. Um, uh, let's end with Peter Wilcox, captain of the Greenpeace Arctic Sunrise. Where do you go from here? Well, I guess the biggest feeling is, is that we don't stop. Uh, for me, stopping means turning over the planet to the oil companies, and I'm not nearly willing to do that. When I started working for environmental groups 40 years ago, I thought this was going to be a fairly easy problem to solve. I was on the Hudson River working on Pete Seeger's boat. Now, as Kumi pointed out, I am scared for the future of my kids. And stopping, quitting is not, doesn't even come close to being an option. And Dmitry Litvinov. Well, I mean, I can only echo what, uh, what Peter said. I mean, this, uh, uh, the, the fight's going to continue. We have no choice if we're going to survive. I want to thank you both for being with us. Dmitry Litvinov is uh, one of the Arctic 30 activists. Peter Wilcox is captain of the Greenpeace Arctic Sunrise ship. Uh, today, Russia granted amnesty to 20,000 people, among them the Arctic 30, 28 Greenpeace activists and two journalists who were covering them, among many others. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global grassroots news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org today. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.